Okay, hello Atlantic Canada. Welcome to uh, the Ecofiscal Commission's Google Hangout to discuss uh, the recycling of carbon pricing revenues uh, if and when carbon pricing ever makes a serious appearance in Atlantic Canada, and we think it will. My name is Chris Reagan. I am chair of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission, and this is actually the fifth of five. It is our final Google Hangout. We have been uh, rolling across the country. We've had a Google Hangout in BC and in Alberta, in Ontario and Quebec, and now we are in Atlantic Canada, and we are talking about how governments should best recycle carbon pricing revenues. We've got four great people to talk about this today. I'm going to moderate the conversation with them. But before I introduce them, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the Ecofiscal Commission's latest report. Last week, we released a report called Choose Wisely. And the title uh, is all about how governments who are carbon pricing need to, I mean, after they've designed a carbon pricing system, they have to think about the second part, which is if you're going to generate a bunch of revenues, and you will, you have to think about what to do with those revenues. And in the report, we talk about six different options. We talk about how governments may choose to just give the money straight back to households and families as a lump sum check, equal across families. We talk about the possibility of cutting personal income taxes or corporate income taxes or both. We talk about uh, the ability to use the revenue to reduce existing public debt, especially in those provinces where debt is high. We talk about using the money to uh, invest in R&D uh, and in clean tech or to use it to finance critical public infrastructure. And the sixth option we talk about is providing transitional support to those emissions intensive industries that will be particularly challenged by a carbon price. So our report talks about those six options. There are other options, but those are the six biggies in our estimation. The report also talks about how governments, of course, care about different things. They have different objectives. So we talk about five of them. We talk about how governments probably care about economic growth, how governments care about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, how they probably care about household fairness of the policy, and if they don't, they probably should, how they should probably think about the competitiveness challenge to those emissions intensive sectors. And the fifth thing we talk about is the public acceptability. And we actually bring some new uh, uh, survey data to the report to talk about how the public does actually have fairly clear views on better versus worse ways of recycling the revenues. So in our report, we talk about the six options of recycling. We talk about the five criteria. And you can just imagine how there are trade-offs around every corner. And there are. Because some options are particularly good for dealing with household fairness, but they're not that great for dealing with economic growth. Some are good at dealing with economic growth, but they don't really uh, deal with something that's, uh, you know, that garners a lot of public opinion. So it's complicated. And in fact, the report could have been called It's Complicated, but that movie title was already took, taken, so we chose Choose Wisely. Because we think that governments really need to th think very carefully about what their objectives are, and given their economic and environmental context, how to make these choices the best. So that's what this um, report is about. And we've gathered four people with us today to talk about this. So let me introduce uh, our four guests. Our first is Elizabeth Beal. She's an economist uh, uh, and an eco-fiscal commissioner. She used to be the president and CEO of the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council, was from 1996 to 2015. That's a lot of years. Holy smokes. And in 2015, she was appointed as a lifetime member of the Atlantic Canada Economics Association and a fellow of the World Academy of Productivity Science. That's Elizabeth. Thank you for joining us. Laurel Broughton is our next guest, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Nova Scotia Business Inc., the business development agency for the province. She formerly is an Ontario cabinet minister and a Bay Street lawyer. And in 2014, that's only less than two years ago, she wrote Charting a Path for Growth, Nova Scotia Tax and Regulatory Review, affectionately known locally as the Broughton Report. Uh, so she's got some clear views about how Nova Scotia uh, can be uh, modifying its uh, tax and fiscal structure uh, in ways to both make a better economy and a better environment. Peter Nicholson 
is semi-retired. He will never retire, actually. He's semi-retired after a career in the public and private sectors. He is the inaugural CEO of the Council of Canadian uh, sorry of the Council of Canadian Academies. He's the was the deputy chief of staff for policy in the PMO. 2003 to 2006. He was a special advisor to the Secretary General of the OECD. And an extra little nugget that I didn't know is that long ago he was an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota, which is, I guess, one reason why he is, is just a sharp, techie guy. Our fourth guest is Finn Poshman, President and CEO, current President and CEO of the Atlantic Provinces Economic Council. And he spent many years before that as the Vice President of Policy Analysis at the C.D. Howe Institute in Toronto. So those are our four guests. They're all here to, uh, to hash out what the best way is that uh, Nova Scotia and other Atlantic provinces should be um, pursuing to recycle their carbon pricing revenues if and when carbon pricing arrives uh, in their part of the world. Um, just before we get into this, um, uh, you can see on my name tag there if you have questions, and some people have already sent questions in by email, but if you have questions that you'd like to send in to us, you can email them to info at ecofiscal.ca, or if you are Twitter savvy, um, then you can send them in with hashtag revenue recycling and or hashtag Atlantic Canada. All right. So we are about to get underway. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to ask each of our four guests for two minutes, uh, a two-minute uh, high-level description of how they think revenue should be recycled. Um, and once we get everybody's two-minute blast, we will see what kind of overlaps we've got and what kind of disagreements we've got, and then we will hash it out. And after about 40 minutes, we will start taking questions that are coming either from Twitter or from email. So, on that note, let's start. Let's start with Elizabeth. Elizabeth Beal, what is your two-minute preferred approach to revenue recycling? Well, thank you, um, uh, Chris. And as you uh, know well, I'm already quite an evangelist for the work of the Ecofiscal Commission, and this latest report on revenue recycling uh, follows from our previous reports, and I think. Uh, the benefits of this report are that it gives such flexibility to policymakers in considering their options. So the conditions right across the four Atlantic provinces uh, vary significantly on issues around um, competitiveness, how they manage their uh, provincial finances, and indeed their approaches to managing the environment. And therefore, the report gives all sorts of options that they can pick up and use uh, as they seek to enhance their their uh, climate uh, change strategies and the move to a lower carbon economy. What I find particularly useful about the report is to think of this in in uh, thirds in terms of going forward, and certainly for. Uh, a province like uh, Nova Scotia where we are significantly dependent on coal-fired electricity generation, we're going to have to do something fairly significant on the transfers back to lower income uh, consumers. And of course you can think that that might even be further complicated by the fact that we have such a significant portion of our population who are older, living in more remote uh, or smaller uh, communities without uh, any kind of ability to absorb uh, any kind of costs that will come or be associated with an increase in the uh, carbon price. So there's a significant amount of our of the revenue that would come in that I think would have to go to that and I'll just I'll, I'll for the sake of argument I'll, I'll, I'll put that at essentially a third. Uh, another third I think we need to target at the competitiveness issue and for all Atlantic provinces who have now taken all sorts of steps to move out more fully into the global environment, uh, addressing our competitiveness, uh, reducing uh, either corporate or the high end of our income tax uh, regime, but even considering other competitiveness initiatives such as significant investments in infrastructure follows. So we'd, we'd be remiss if we didn't tackle competitiveness. And the final third um, really has to go back to 
our, our continued commitments to um, uh, improve uh, uh, efficiency uh, of new technology and the adaptation to new technologies that will re improve our energy efficiency. And I wouldn't have frankly uh, thought of that as a top priority myself, but the audiences that I've been speaking to lately really keep saying that. What's the point of getting a lot of revenue in on carbon if we're not going to go back in and invest in the steps we need to improve either uh, the innovation side of the energy agenda or the improvements in energy uh, efficiency. And I, from that point of view, I'm very much on the adaptation side of the uh, the agenda. I, I look at what's happened in, for example, many, many southern countries in terms of the access now to solar technology and how that's really changing household use of energy. Uh, we may not have the perfect technologies here right now, but those may come along. Uh, I'm less um, willing to spend it on big new uh, tech, risky technologies. I really think that's a big role for the federal government and so I'd prefer to move more on the adaptation uh, rather than on us investing in, in much riskier technologies. Okay, thank you very much. So roughly a third to transfers to low-income households because of electricity, roughly a third to competitiveness, roughly to dealing with that, roughly a third to improving energy efficiency and new technology. One of the things I'd like to come back to at some point with, with, with some set of you is whether the aging issue is, is, is different and makes you think differently about the challenges in Atlantic Canada, uh, but also about whether corporate income tax cuts can, can deal with the competitiveness challenge well enough. So just flag those as things I'd like to come back to. How about if we go to Finn Poshman next? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm going to come at this uh, uh, at the first cut from a pure theory level. Uh, and that means the answer, of course, is it depends. Uh, so uh, we, have, we have an assumption that there's uh, carbon uh, revenue uh, uh, to be achieved or derived through a carbon price. Uh, but the response to it and how much revenue you have to deal with uh, depends a lot on the composition of your carbon pricing mechanism. So, for example, uh, if we go, th if we use a carbon tax approach, as many economists would advocate, we have a pretty good uh, identifiable revenue stream in the short term. Uh, if the uh, if the mechanism we adopt is a cap and trade mechanism, uh, then something very different happens. Uh, you may design the mechanism to produce some revenue. You may design the mechanism so it produces no revenue, whatever. Uh, for, uh, for regional government. And the other thing that uh, the, the reason depends on the, the first cut is that the distributional impact and the industrial impacts are going to be quite different uh, as between the two systems. So that's, uh, that's, that's one, uh, one observation. Uh, another is that uh, the uh, uh, policy goal matters. So we're talking at the provincial policy level, so uh, how big a tax uh, are or uh, do we wish to uh, impose? How much abatement uh, do we want to achieve? Uh, so, for example, in New Brunswick, owing to changes in industrial composition, uh, primarily uh, the elimination of uh, uh, several important or large facilities, uh, New Brunswick's uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 emissions are already uh, at, uh, at levels that they were in, uh, in the 90s on uh, some estimates. Uh, likewise, in Nova Scotia, uh, Nova Scotia had a uh, pretty aggressive 2015 target. Uh, as far as we can tell, that's been achieved, and through uh, 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 scheduled decreases in reliance on coal uh, as an electricity source, uh, and increasing reliance on hydroelectric uh, transmission uh, through the next five years, uh, Nova Scotia is currently on track to uh, to meet or exceed the province's emissions goals for 2020. So there's a so the the, the question is how much uh, how much revenue are we going to talk about and uh, uh, what's the industrial impact of the mechanism that we chose to uh, uh, derive that revenue. And uh, the final uh, sorry, the, from a pure theory perspective, uh, the sweet spot for uh, tax relief, if economic efficiency is our goal, uh, is pretty convincingly uh, the corporation income tax. 
so that's uh, that's where theory leads you. Uh, however, the uh, the distributional impacts or the uh, social dis uh, impacts, the distributional impacts, uh, are not very pretty uh, if that's your route, uh, and uh, that too would uh, would uh, require a, a government response or and a government response within the context of what our policy goal was uh, was determined to be. So there's a lot of it depends, uh, but the, my, my bottom line is uh, uh, other things being equal. Uh, we would look for corporation income tax reduction, uh, and uh, the, uh, say we had extracted thirty dollars a ton from uh, Scotia's uh, carbon emissions. Uh, that would go a long way to bringing the corporation income tax uh, down. Uh, that would matter a lot for domestic uh, businesses, uh, less so for uh, multinational investments and trade in, in the province. But it would be growth improving. Uh, it would, of course. Uh, 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 require uh, some offsetting compensations uh, to to improve uh, household distribution uh, household distribution impacts. Thank you, Finn. So you're quite right. It does depend, uh, and that that also could have been the title of the report. It depends. We just felt that wasn't quite as punchy as. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much. So we're probably going to come back. Um, on Finn's point, I mean, Finn did talk about, from an efficiency point of view, offsetting cuts to CIT, the corporate income tax, might make a lot of sense. Um, and we'll come back to one of his points about designing a cap and trade system to produce no revenue. If this might have piqued somebody's interest, it certainly piqued my interest. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to push Finn on that point later on. Um, Laurel Broden, the microphone is yours. Great. Well, thank you. Um, pleased to have a chance to join in the conversation about what uh, we can uh, collectively uh, see the benefits of revenue that would be generated from a carbon tax in the province. Um, certainly my perspective is one that we would want to advance uh, a more competitive, more prosperous Nova Scotia. Um, there's no doubt that that has to be the focus. The starting point must be that it is revenue neutral. Um, and that it really does redress the impact on low-income households, um, both through a household transfer. I would put um, that as a, as a key element to um, remedy the added costs that they would help, as well as through helping uh, lower-income Nova Scotians reduce their costs. So that support in uh, finding avenues, for example, if uh, it is with respect to uh, transit or social assistance and the ability to be able to uh, have a lower um, electricity bills as an example. So lots of, of things have been done um, in that regard in other jurisdictions and have been here and could be looked at. Um, then to drive a, a broader change, um, uh, revenue that could be generated from uh, such a tax does allow the province to examine and look at some of the areas where that need redress, uh, personal income tax reductions, corporate tax. So with respect to personal income tax reductions, one of the key things is really to examine sort of both ends of the spectrum. Uh, we want to see innovation and competitiveness. We want entrepreneurs to set up in the province. So you have to certainly look at that higher end of taxation uh, where, um, where we will have uh, those individuals. You must also look at the impediments to work, the impediments to entry into work. So the basic personal amount, examining, uh, you know, many of us would have looked at the reality for some families that it would actually cost uh, a mother to enter the workforce when she adds in all of her costs. So we, as a society, need to take a look at that. So it really is the entry point for overall tax uh, system redesign. That's what I talked about in the report, and you know. To be frank, I didn't necessarily uh, go into examining that report with the fact that it would be a recommendation that this is our source of revenue that the province should find. Uh, lots of great reasons to look at it, but separate and apart, it really is a mechanism that actually allows us to be having this conversation and to be look at how can we tackle the issue of high corporate tax, how can we tackle the issue of high personal tax, how could we elevate the basic personal allowance uh, for families? So, uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes as an example is Larry Sanders, and he talks, all taxes discourage something. Why not discourage bad things like pollution rather than good things like working? 
And uh, I think that is um, the exciting part of being able to have this conversation. We could actually redress those issues. So that's sort of in a nutshell uh, where I would go. Great. Thank you very much. So very good pitch and explanation for basically a tax shift, right? Shift away from bad taxes and shift toward good taxes, but keep the overall level of taxes roughly constant. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that will, uh, will generate some disagreement somewhere along the way. Um, Peter Nicholson was having some technological issues, uh, but I think he is back with us. So Peter, do you, uh, are you alive and well and you can give us your two-minute spiel? Yes. Peter, are you there? Peter is not there. Okay, while Peter is still solving his technological challenges, um, let me uh, let me come back to some of these points. Um, okay, we're going to keep trying that. All right, so let's come back to Elizabeth's point about competitiveness, um, and I'd like Laurel and. Uh, and Finn to comment on this as well. So my question, I guess, is if we're worried about competitiveness uh, of either a, you know the emissions intensive sectors or more generally, does a corporate tax cut get us what we need? Uh, and I, we make the point in the report that the corporate income tax cut may generate kind of economy-wide benefits in terms of investment and growth but it may be too blunt an instrument to deal with the competitiveness challenges in the emissions intensive sectors. And probably you're not going to have corporate income tax cuts for some sectors and not for other sectors because you probably want a more neutral tax. So a quick comment on that issue, all three of you. Let's start with Elizabeth. Well, I, I, one of the challenges is that, as you know, we don't have an even playing field even when you look at nominal corporate tax rates because we've got all sorts of other policies that intervene uh, in there. For example, in Nova Scotia, we have a manufacturing and processing tax credit. So there's tax credits galore in numerous jurisdictions that kind of confuse the issue. And one of the things that comes out of our report is that you can't look at a carbon tax in isolation from other competitiveness factors that in other words there may be more go a lot more going on and just just by evidence as Finn was pointing out the enormous loss of output in New Brunswick's forest industries uh, that have happened over the last 10 or 15 years which which uh, go well beyond just the challenges around energy pricing and those inputs into the forest sector so you have to you have to Look at these things in a very broad context. Do I do I think that um, uh, improvements in the carbon uh, in the uh, corporate income tax would necessarily put Nova Scotia's industry onto a, a better uh, playing field in terms of global competition? Not necessarily, but I do think it sends a significant signal. And uh, plus, we also have inconsistencies just between our small business uh, rate and uh, the regular corporate income tax that really need to be addressed. So I think part of this is about sending a signal. And Laurel's point about that you're that you're moving away from, uh, you know, to taxing the things we should be taxing and and reducing, you know, the disincentives of the tax system. I think is a primary one. And, I've, and that's why I think we may indeed want to look at the issues in the corporate uh, tax across all four Atlantic provinces. But I would pair that up with getting rid of some of those. I mean, this is a, a, as a lever to actually improve the competitiveness generally of the tax system. And I'd be looking for ways to remove all sorts of inefficient tax credits, or in my view, inefficient tax credits at the same time. Okay, perfect. So Finn and Laurel, I'd like you to hold your thoughts because we're going to try to come back to Peter who's going to try some combination of speakerphone and a magic policy wand. So Peter Nicholson, give us, give us, a, give us your two minutes if you can. Let's see what happens. Okay, here, here would be my two minutes. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly, or at least I can. Okay. So 
I, I don't know to what extent I'm going to be repeating what others have said. But anyway, in Nova Scotia, I think we know that the prevailing attitude toward carbon pricing lies somewhere between skeptical and outright hostile. Uh, so there's a steep hill to climb before we can even get to recycling any revenue. And a plan to allocate such revenue it will, in fact, have to be a big part of selling Nova Scotians on carbon pricing in the first place. So recycling must be at least as much about politics as about economics. So in that regard, the allocation of revenue must be seen to be both fair to the vulnerable and appropriate to Nova Scotia's economic circumstances, and public perception will matter crucially, so the recycling plan uh, needs to be transparent and easily communicated. So based on those objectives and constraints, I'm going to propose a three-part allocation. First, 25% would be distributed as a targeted cash rebate to the well to the less well-off. For example, probably up to the median income, not just the first couple of quintiles. A second, 50% would fund a reduction in income taxes, with 85% of that amount allocated to personal tax reduction and 15% to corporate reduction. And these proportions mirror the relative yield of the two taxes currently. The PIT reduction would increase acceptability of carbon pricing generally, and each tax reduction would have positive economic impact, particularly given the high prevailing rates in Nova Scotia. A third and finally, 25% would be allocated to support development and implementation of innovative carbon-reducing technologies. Uh, the symbolism of such specific earmarking could increase public support for carbon pricing, uh, but moreover, and perhaps more important, Nova Scotia needs to do more to encourage innovative economic development and the adoption of best practices. So, in conclusion, this 25-50-25 allocation could be easily measured and tracked so that the government could be held to account, and that kind of assurance is needed to generate the trust of a skeptical public, and all told, uh, such an allocation might convince Nova Scotians that carbon pricing is not such a bad idea after all. Excellent. We also might require Peter uh, Nicholson as the primary salesman and spokesperson for pushing the carbon price. If you can explain it that clearly, um, then then I think that's that's going to work. Okay. So you all heard it. 25% um, cash rebates to low-income people up to the median. 50% uh, income tax cuts, largely um, skewed toward personal income tax, but some on corporate tax. So Finn and Laurel, uh, I'm going to ask you next to come back on your views on the corporate income tax because that's going to be relevant to Peter's uh, recommendation. But then I'm going to get Peter to come back at a later time, uh, which means in a few minutes, and talk about how easy it is for governments to devote that last 25% to R&D or clean tech and low carbon activities. I want to explore how easy or difficult it is for governments to do that. So while Peter's thinking about that, back to Finn first and then Laurel for some quick views on the competitiveness and whether it can be adequately dealt with by CIT cuts or if you want to say anything else about corporate income tax cuts. Finn. Okay, thank you, Chris, and uh, uh, a bunch of great comments there. Uh, I, I hesitate to, to use a phrase. Uh, it's complicated well, uh, because uh, uh, some of the some of the issues are very complicated. But it's it's much better off to uh, to, to treat them in a simple way and uh, reflect on what policy could address and what it can't. Uh, so first, competitiveness. Uh, when industry talks about uh, competitiveness, uh, we're usually referring to uh, trade exposed. Uh, so the, the, the magic phrase is uh, a carbon intensive or energy intensive uh, trade exposed sectors. Uh, and uh, the, the worry is that uh, activity and uh, carbon emissions associated with activity uh, leak from our jurisdiction if we impose a carbon tax to, uh, to a jurisdiction that uh, uh, does not impose a carbon tax or where emissions are uh, less uh, less pricey if there is one. So that's the competitiveness worry. Uh, and uh, it, it matters for uh, trade-oriented economies like ours. Uh, will a, uh, would 
corporate income tax reduction address that? Well, no, it won't. Uh, it wouldn't do in, in the trade context unless uh, the, the CIT reductions were so dramatically lower the cost of capital investment that uh, you could uh, underprice uh, imports that had uh, a higher uh, uh, emissions or energy intensity and uh, lower carbon taxes attached to them. So, you know, no, the, the lower, a lower CIT would be unlikely to go very far in addressing the trade competitiveness question. Uh, with the other mechanisms that have been suggested for doing that uh, rely on uh, what we call border tax adjustments. So, in other words, uh, we, we charge uh, explicitly uh, a tax on, on energy intensive imports. Uh, which is technically possible, rather horrific to contemplate uh, in practice uh, because of uh, all the steps involved both in assessing the carbon intensity of an import uh, and a re-import uh, as well as uh, the administrative tracking thereof. So pretty problematic. We, we don't have a very good way of addressing it. Okay, thank you, Finn. Laurel, uh, your thoughts on corporate income tax cuts and the competitiveness issue? Uh, and I guess, you know, on Peter's split between PIT cuts and CIT yeah. cuts, if you want to comment on that. I mean, I think that as I suggested and I had uh, written in the tax report, it has to be a comprehensive approach. The uh, pollution tax, carbon tax allows us to think about that. And the combination has to be personal income tax reductions and corporate tax reductions. But certainly I can tell you in the role that I have now as we seek to uh, see investment from other jurisdictions or companies that have their operations elsewhere and have them coming into Nova Scotia, the fact that we have high personal income tax, high corporate tax, and high uh, sales tax, uh, HST, as our numbers, are disincentives. And we have to manage that and respond to that uh, in that way. But I want to put a different angle on the competitiveness as well, though, and talk about the fact that our companies are all part of uh, global export. We're a small jurisdiction where all of our products, all of our, our seafood, our ICT, everything that we do, uh, make, sell, service, uh, leaves uh, leave our, our borders and goes on to elsewhere. And, and that aspect of making sure that uh, we are viewed as uh, good, responsible players in a global value chain and that our companies are managing their GHG um, and, and counting those GHG elements, I think, has, has received a particular import this year. Certainly, we saw a global conversation when it came to we need to collectively tackle climate change. Uh, we also have uh, had a comment or criticism of, that suppliers in Canada were not doing enough to manage uh, change, climate change risks and that major purchasers should encourage the Canadian suppliers to set emissions targets. So if we want to be part of selling our products and services to the world, we have to be part of the agenda for sustainability and embrace a triple bottom line approach. Um, so that also necessitates us to be engaged and part of this conversation. There's no one particular element that's going to resolve all issues. It has to be looked at comprehensively, but a carbon tax conversation allows us uh, to look at it comprehensively and, in fact, to also start to engage in the conversation of the demographic reality in this province, that the income tax base is going to go down. That is, uh, that is a future reality, and uh, this is one avenue to start to begin to redress that issue. Great, thank you. Okay, so let me let me come to the issue of, of and, and Peter raised it beautifully, that you know if, if the current thinking about a carbon price is not overwhelmingly positive, it may well be the case that the, the way government thinks about recycling the revenue becomes part of the overall uh, sales package, if you like. Um, and that means you know, the, 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 uh, the public support that is associated with any type matters. So here's, there's an interesting tension. Um, in, the, um, in the survey, the new public opinion survey evidence that we brought in to the report uh, that was produced by Bruce Anderson and Abacus Data, is that the two most popular uh, approaches for recycling, the ones that garner the most support for, rev for carbon pricing in general, are when it's recycled into financing infrastructure and recycled into financing uh, low carbon technologies. Okay? Those are the two that stand out. Um, and so that, and that, sat that satisfies, I guess, the, the criterion that Peter was looking for. 
But at the same time, one of the points that we make in the report is that investing in risky, low-carbon technologies is something that's difficult for governments to do. And it's sometimes difficult to do it in a way that doesn't become politicized. So can we, how do we have this? How do, how do we talk about this? Is there a way that we can make these investments uh, effectively? Can you build a machine that can make these investments effectively that doesn't end up being a poor expenditure of taxpayers' dollars? And I'll go to Peter and then Elizabeth on that. Yeah, well, I mean, that is a, that's a famous conundrum, and there isn't, an, obviously, any real easy answer to it. It does require discipline. I, I would see in my proposal a, really a multiplicity of ways in which low-carbon technologies could be supported. So some of that money, and just to put a dollar figure on it, if we take the, the figures from your report from Nova Scotia, there'd be about $500 million to recycle uh, at a $30 price, I think it's 493 but let's say five, 500 So 125 million would be 25% uh, of that, and that's the amount we're talking about to promote low carbon technologies. Now, some of that would, could go to classic R&D uh, through the ordinary granting process, um, to universities primarily, but perhaps also to community colleges. But then, uh, most of it would, I think, have to go into demonstration projects uh, approaching commercial scale, in which case you'd need uh, really a collaboration, a partnership with private sector players. I think there's also an opportunity for some venture capital investment here. But to, to your point, Chris, that, that should be done probably in the, in the manner of what's sometimes called a sidecar, where the government uh, contribution is, invests alongside uh, private sector VCs, probably in a, in a smaller amount. And uh, so the government is not the one that's picking the, the winners there in, in, in any way. And then finally, I think that some of this money uh, would have to be used for the diffusion of good technologies and the diffusion of best practices more broadly throughout the economy. I mean, the the biggest advantage of innovation is not doesn't go necessarily to the jurisdiction that first invents something, but rather it's through the, the diffusion of that innovation throughout society. And uh, so we should be putting a lot more emphasis, in my view, on getting the best practices out there uh, wherever they apply. So if you're looking at $125 million, while well, it's a lot of money by Nova Scotia standards, I mean, compared with the Nova Corp and NSBI, et cetera, it doesn't go all that far when you spread it across the, the four uh, functions that I mentioned. Um, as for how you do that effectively so that uh, rent seekers don't end up rolling groups, uh, you end up making stupid investments. Well, I mean, what more can you say uh, then you need a disciplined public service, you need accountability and transparency, uh, you need some goodwill, obviously. Uh, there are techniques to try and minimize the, the risk of uh, those well-known risks. Uh, one of them I mentioned specifically being the, the sidecar type of uh, venture capital partnering. Uh, but uh, I think there are other mechanisms. But at the end of the day, it comes down to the skill and the integrity of the people who are handling the funds. Good, thank you. Okay, so quick comments on on this point: the ability to invest in R and D from uh, from Elizabeth and Finn, and then I'm going to bring us back to some questions that have come in on how to protect the the low income households the best. Elizabeth, I, well, just a f quick comment first on something that uh, Laurel said, and uh, she reflected on the importance of selling the uh, sustainability agenda as an important tool in competitiveness going forward. And I, I really do think attitudes are, start, are, are shifting on that. In other words, the political acceptance of carbon pricing is growing as industry leaders speak about this, including in our, in our own um, uh, region. And uh, as as we understand fully that that we that we need to embrace this trend that is emerging on a global basis, and we can't stay out of this, or we're going to lose on the trade uh, front. I think that's absolutely vital. Um, 
just on on the R and D side, my it's hard to talk about this in Nova Scotia without reflecting on uh, the electricity sector, where half our emissions uh, come from because of a reliance on uh, on uh, uh, coal production. And um, there, it's 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 tricky. Uh, we have to be very cautious, in my view, about not putting too much emphasis on on R and D that might we might that might. Uh, trick, uh, flow into the rate base. I really think that it's much better to, for example, on the tidal power, where really Nova Scotia and New Brunswick should be working together uh, on this front. Uh, that should stay well out on on a, as a technology experiment at this point, rather than being them with efforts to uh, bring it solidly into uh, the rate base. I think we have to be very careful that consumers don't get fatigued by efforts to uh, build up uh, higher cost renewables into uh, electricity um, uh, production. So we have to keep a lot of flexibility on that tool. And um, But I, I think there are lots of things that could be done on this front, including some uh, regional solutions here. So I'd, I'd like to see the four provinces could really, because we do have a lot that's different, but we also have a lot in common, and we could be looking at the solution side of it, including how we improve our integration across the region, that would greatly increase our efficiency on the electricity side, and I think that would be extremely helpful. Perfect. Finn, do you have uh, any thoughts on government's ability to make investments in low-carbon technologies? Uh, well, first, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd encourage some some modesty or, or humility. Uh, because as, as, as Peter pointed out, when we're, we're spraying the potential revenues that we're talking about across a number of activities, so you divide it up and divide it up for a few times, and uh, we don't have a lot left to play with uh, in these provinces. So uh, uh, we should be a little bit uh, modest about uh, our ability well, to... Uh, Peter's made. numbers are for $125 million. Yeah. Peter's numbers are for $125 million. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Uh, but uh, when we do, when we just, uh, all he's saying is when we divide it up across activities, uh, the numbers start getting smaller. Uh, second, uh, a lot of the things that we should think about are around innovation policy, encouraging innovation, whether we're using the tax or granting systems, uh, or Brexit courts, uh, or uh, venture capital mechanisms. These are things that we should be thinking about anyway. And uh, it might be useful to to uh, to make some separation in uh, some mental separation uh, in thinking about those policies, so that we're not uh, layering on too many policy objectives on, on a given program. And I think I think those are the key points. Uh, no, governments aren't aren't very good at uh, identifying strategies. There's one thing uh, Elizabeth raised a very very good point uh, about electricity. Uh, in Ontario, uh, the, uh, the government policy over the course of years uh, drove out a significant amount of carbon emissions through fall in pursuit of uh, renewable technologies. It did so in an incredibly expensive way. Uh, and uh, so uh, electricity bills, which is a concern to households, uh, you know, certainly you know, went on, a, on an upward track, and we can think of that as a, as a carbon tax if we like. And this is already in train uh, in Nova Scotia, uh, because uh, yes, we, we are we're heavily reliant or we're reliant on coal. Uh, that is changing, and great payers will be paying for it. So uh, we know over the next few years that uh, that, that rates uh, will be going up. Uh, household electricity rates will be going up, and we also know that uh, our emissions will be going down sharply. Okay, thank you, Finn. Look, this is I'm gonna I'm gonna use that as a segue. I've got a bunch of questions, some of which came in beforehand on email, some of which are coming in now by Twitter, uh, and there's about five questions that all overlap, and so I, I won't hit any one of them perfectly, but I'm going to hit the bunch of them, I think, about right. Because they're all about low-income households, they're about electricity bills, they're about uh, if we give cash transfers to households, um, is that an adequate way to deal with the higher electricity cost? And is it an adequate way to deal simply with the overall impact beyond electricity on low-income households? There's another question that says, you know, this approach of having a carbon price and a dividend where you take 100% of the revenues and you carve it up into checks, 
given back lump sum to every family, um, uh, which actually would be consistent with revenue neutrality, Laurel. I, I mean, I think you could look at it that way if you're giving all the revenue back. So one question is, you know, why doesn't this approach get more attention? So can we have you all give a quick response on this issue? But it, the issue is, you know, how much, how important is it that we actually deal with the low-income households and what's the best way to deal with the low-income households? Is it a check in the mail or is it some something that's explicitly tied household by household to their electricity bills? Uh, let's go with Finn. Quick answers on this one, if you can. Okay. Well, some households, as I pointed out, uh, we're already paying for uh, for carbon emissions mitigation through uh, through, uh, through electricity bills. Uh, the uh, on a pure distributional basis, uh, expect low income households is uh, is the, the uh, need to address it. Uh, and you know, I think both theory and practice is pretty strong on this point. Uh, but I'll just say uh, one giant caution: uh, the, the size of a dividend or the existence of a dividend uh, is something that is unsafe to make extremely large assumptions about. So we may be able to design systems that produce revenue, uh, but whether there is an economic dividend to be achieved uh, is, uh, and the size of it, if there is, is very unclear. And uh, from the Ecofiscal Commission's uh, uh, position papers, there's a, there are a couple of pages of Ken McKenzie's report that are absolutely crucial reading. They're some of the most important points to make, which is that uh, if we impose a carbon tax in an existing framework, we cannot, and lower another tax, we can't assume that uh, economic efficiency is necessarily improved. It may improve, uh, but we can't assume it, and because of the design and uh, level of other taxes, uh, it may be very small and in some, some circumstances could be even negative if um, activity uh, shrinks in a line. So this is a good distinction, Finn. So there's actually three distinctions. One is the dividend in terms of revenues, right? So we could in fact, you know, compute the revenues and give it 100% back. There's the economic dividend, which is, which you could actually divide up into the effect on growth and the effect on this broader less tangible thing called efficiency, right? Uh, and you're quite right that Ken McKenzie's comments on that say that, you know, the uh, the interaction of the taxes actually complicates things. Okay, but on the household transfers point, uh, can we come back? Let's go to Laurel and then Peter and uh, Elizabeth. So on household transfers, I think that you have to look at it in terms of ensuring its progressivity. So um, the impact on families uh, and individuals of different income levels will not be the same. They will not feel it in the same way. So uh, stuff that we take have to be particularly sensitive to that. Um, and I think that that's why, in large measure, um, you know, there are, um, are a number of models that you can follow. Certainly BC has a model. Um, there's a number of jurisdictions that you can look at in terms of helping those at the lowest income. But I want to go back to the fact that uh, a carbon tax will generate significant resource, but not uh, not that much significant resource. And so I think the reason that fiscal demonstrated in your assessment that uh, personal and corporate income tax cuts were of highest priority in this jurisdiction in Nova Scotia is reflective of where the corporate and, and personal tax rates are. And so I would really say I think that in order the resource has to be driven to the areas of highest priorities so that families feel it. It has to be very purposeful, it has to be very clear, it has to be very progressive, and it has to be extremely transparent. You cannot have, um, you, I, I think you won't see success in terms of a, a, a thoughtful conversation about this if some of the revenue ends up going to uh, tax credits uh, to industry. Again, really driving it to a way that does not further complicate the tax system, uh, actually simplify it, is part of an overall transition where we shift away from income tax uh, to recognize the demographic realities that are here. And I think that's why, for me, personal income tax, corporate income tax, and then we need to those uh, of lowest income, both in terms of fiscal support, dollars being transferred to them, 
Um, and also thoughtful work done with those groups who are export around the country and around the world who are particularly knowledgeable about how can we, in fact, make our rental housing stock more efficient so that someone doesn't have a high electricity bill. How do we, what programs work best in terms of changing those windows or making sure that uh, those costs are, are brought down for families? So I would say that that's really, it would be, um, again, easier to communicate if we have only those few buckets and it will be more felt by the citizens in a positive way of seeing, actually seeing uh, a benefit to them. And, you know, I think we can take a page out of the book of British Columbia. OECD complimented me and the approach that they took and said, you know, the implementation of the carbon tax was as good as you can have to a textbook case. I think we can learn a lot if we look to the other uh, Canadian coast. Good, thank you. Peter, and then Elizabeth. Yeah, uh, well, first of all, uh, I would favor a, a system of what I call rebates to low income based more or less on the philosophy of the BST uh, offset. I don't think it should be tied to an electricity bill for a couple of reasons. First of all, you want, uh, well, it would be extremely, although it's easy to calculate obviously what the electricity bill is, I think you want to retain the incentive for people to economize on their use of carbon intense fuel. Uh, so you don't want to really subsidize something that uh, you're, you're trying to reduce. Uh, secondly, there's more uh, there's more impact of a carbon tax than just on electricity. It clearly is going to affect motor fuels, etc. Bottom line is, I think it's much better to have a standard uh, grant that, in my case, with the $125 million, uh, distributed some way uh, across low incomes. Uh, it's, it's not a, it's not a Obviously, a political winner. That we, no matter what you do, you'll have a lot of criticism. Uh, as for the uh, for the uniform sort of demo grant, take the total amount and divide it by the population of Nova Scotia, give it as a set of uh, of tax and and the, the income from which would be taxable. That's a scheme that Lars Osborne put forward, and I read his paper. Uh, I thought it was an excellent piece of work, by the way. But at the end of the day. I think it is important to see some reduction in the, both the income tax and the corporate tax burden. I think that uh, that satisfies a lot of other objectives, uh, as well as a certain portion available to encourage uh, more, more modern carbon uh, uh, conserving technologies. Uh, so while I was impressed with, with Lars's proposal, uh, I thought it really went a bit too far <laughs> on the fairness dimension, if I could put it that way. I think that there are some dynamic effects that come through tax reduction and encouraging technology that in the longer run would, uh, uh, would be a better deal for Nova Scotia. And I think by allocating, let's say, 25% to low-income offset, uh, you can achieve the fairness objective. Excellent. I, I I think this is one of the fascinating things that if you give money back lump sum, if you gave all of the revenue back lump sum, it's very visible. It's very tangible. It may actually be popular. Uh, it may it may improve the durability of the policy. But every time you give money back lump sum, you are giving up the opportunity to reduce very distortionary taxes. And in Nova Scotia's case, those personal and corporate taxes are high enough to be damaging uh, and so reducing those may actually generate real long-term benefits for the economy so you know like it's usually the case for government making tough decisions uh, you know this is a tough decision uh, Elizabeth you're gonna get almost oh hold on do you have a comment on that Peter very quickly yeah just 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 one point that I didn't make earlier again if you use the uh, the 500 million dollar for the total uh, revenue generated by a $30 a ton tax, uh, that would produce, in my uh, proposal for reducing the corporate and, and, and personal income taxes, about an 8.5% reduction. So it is quite meaningful. Uh, I just think it's important to be aware that this is not a trivial reduction, that's all. Very good, thank you. Okay, Elizabeth, on this point. 
I, well, I had initially suggested about 30% should be attributed to transfers. That would be particularly true for Nova Scotia and PEI, where electricity uh, costs are high and likely to remain particularly high. The, the, I, I do absolutely feel this should be done through a, the tax system, through the, uh, whether it should be matched up with the existing HST or GST credit. I really. I have my doubts as to whether that's adequate. We've got such a high proportion of our working population in that lower, uh, lower mid-income uh, group compared to other jurisdictions that that we really would have to think about the the political uh, acceptability on that front. The other thing there is for us to think about is just a, a, a point I made earlier, just about a, the portion of our population that live outside of urban areas and who are dependent on their cars for travel, who are dependent largely on oil for home heating in addition to the high electricity costs, they have no ability to substitute. So the impact of a carbon price is just an additional cost. A high portion of that population are also living in older housing. In other words, the efficiency with low efficiency on terms of our energy efficiency. So it's a challenge for policymakers to decide uh, how they target their assistance at that um, at that uh, portion of the population. Perfect. Okay, folks, we have, uh, amazingly, we have gotten to the 56-minute mark. We are out of time. So I'm going to give you each, uh, I'm going to give you each about 30 seconds to provide a uh, snappy sum up of whatever it is that you want to say. Uh, 30 seconds, and we are going to start with Finn Poshman, and then I'm going to get the last word. Finn Poshman. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll use the Elizabeth as a jumping off point. Yes. Uh, when you have a relatively old population, a relatively rural population, uh, the distributional impacts of the carbon tax can be a lot uglier than, uh, and harder to adjust to than in other uh, situations. Uh, likewise, uh, when you already have a high personal income tax and a high corporate income tax, uh, the marginal cost of public funds is, uh, is extremely high, uh, and you're very carefully about uh, choosing tax mixes that will uh, be most efficient in that sense. In other words, getting down the most damaging taxes. Uh, the other, uh, look, uh, we, we were talking about a $500 million number for Nova Scotia. Uh, it's uh, uh, That's a significant amount of money for the tax system. Uh, to handle, it can have uh, redistribute to low incomes uh, would be uh, could be meaningful in an aggressive political acceptance. Uh, but uh, if we do that, of course, we give up a lot of other opportunities. Okay, thank you, Finn. I'm going to go to Peter Nicholson now for 30 seconds of Nicholson wisdom. Okay. Well, look, I, uh, look, we're facing a world where carbon is going to be priced. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And so eventually, one way or another, Nova Scotia and the Atlantic provinces are going to be, have to be part of this movement. Uh, I do think, nevertheless, that uh, being there earlier rather than later is, is good for the province overall. Uh, but for that to happen, this has to be far more politically acceptable than it is today. Uh, whether uh, my 25% allocation to the fairness bucket is sufficient, I think it's something that one would have to revisit uh, with, a, with a sharper pencil, uh, but uh, there is some number which still leaves room for a tax reduction, which for the reasons Finn has said, uh, is also going to be an important part of the mix, and frankly, of the selling job uh, from the median income on up. Perfect. Okay, Elizabeth. Well, I, 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 I would like to see all the provinces take a move in the fav in the direction of uh, carbon pricing. If if not in this year's budget, uh, certainly in next year. I think it would be a shame for Atlantic Canada to be late to this party, which we all agree is uh, moving along. And I think it's an opportunity. Well, we've discussed the revenue opportunities for governments to do things differently and to strengthen their progressive economic agenda. And I think that. I think the debate is moving along in, in our favor, and I'd, I'd like to push them to get over that hump. Good, thank you. Laurel, take us home. You get the second last word. So use the carbon tax uh, to implement it, drive comprehensive tax reform through it, 
uh, always with a view to our global competitiveness, recognizing we sell our goods and services around the world, um, and recognizing that we need to see relief in this province from high personal income tax, uh, lift it off those families, in particular those who need it the most, uh, be transparent about it, I encourage entrepreneurs to set up in this jurisdiction uh, as a result of making sure that our taxation system is more transparent, more sustainable, um, and more um, recognized and in keeping with uh, ensuring that those dollars uh, that would be taken from a carbon tax remain in the province uh, and help Nova Scotians uh, have a more prosperous future. Perfect. Thank you all very much. I want to thank everybody out there in, uh, in Google land uh, for watching this Hangout. Um, if you've, if, I would encourage you to take an opportunity to go to the EcoFiscal website and watch some of the other Google Hangouts. As I said at the beginning, we had one in BC, we had one in Alberta, one in Ontario, one in Quebec, and this one. And the fascinating thing about this report, I think, but the fascinating thing about these conversations is that the overall framework is the same. We're talking about recycling carbon pricing revenues. We're talking about the same general set of options. We're talking about the same pros and cons about the different options, but the conversation ends up being different in every region. And this is, you know, this is a point that we made when we wrote The Way Forward, which was that provinces could very practically carbon price because provinces are very different. Uh, not only can you design the systems to the provincial specs, but you can keep the revenue in the province to recycle the way you would want. Uh, and these conversations are, are reveal that, that the kinds of discussions you have, the kinds of tensions you have about the best way to recycle the revenues are different in the provinces. So, for example, in Quebec, there's a lot of discussion about infrastructure. Uh, here in Atlantic Canada, there's a lot of discussion about the benefits from lowering personal and corporate income taxes. In Alberta, there's a lot of discussion about, uh, about how to protect the competitiveness of the emissions intensive sectors. So different provinces require different things and that just underlines the importance of the provincial focus. So thank you all very much for participating in this. Peter Nicholson, Elizabeth Beal, Finn Poshman and Laurel Broughton, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules. Uh, for participating in this conversation. This has been very educational, very useful. So thank you all very much on that. I just want to wish you all a very good day. I hope the sun comes out in Atlantic Canada because it has finally come out in Montreal. So thank you all very much and have a good day. Great. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.